Hey everyone, Pastor Brad here today on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. I absolutely wish that I was with you guys in church today having a worship service. Um, this is strange. Um, this is a unique experience. I don't think I will ever worship uh, this way again. I don't know how long we'll be doing this for the next potentially couple weeks, but um, this is definitely a strange way to worship on Sunday morning. Uh, it gives us a great example of how God will shake us out of our stagnant lives to uh, to make us experience something different. Um, I have a huge audience here today. Um, a lot of people in front of me. Um, I have Figment here. Snoopy is here. Uh, Ray from Star Wars. Leonardo from the Ninja Turtles is present. Uh, hey, Mickey, how are you doing? Um, I grabbed some stuffed animals from my kids' room so I don't feel alone. Um, I miss all of you. I just want you to know that. But uh, we are going to worship the Lord today. We're going to, uh, I pray, deliver a spirit-filled message to you. And I, I desperately pray that you get some encouragement and some hope out of it. So let us open with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for being a great, perfect God. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for guiding us. Lord, I pray that you keep us safe. I pray that you protect us, and I pray that you encourage us every possible way that we need to be encouraged. Lord, I know we are not perfect. I know that we don't deserve your love and your grace and your mercy, yet you give it to us, Lord. So thank you. And I pray that you are with those watching this video. I pray that you are with those who are not watching this video. I pray that your kingdom is seen revealed in the whole world. Lord, be with us, keep us safe, protected, and love us. For we ask this in your name. Amen. All right, so today we're wrestling with Ephesians. Last week we began our study on Ephesians, and we started with chapter 1 right at the beginning. Spoiler alert, we're going to go through the book of Ephesians. Um, and we were wrestling with the idea of what is Ephesians. Now, Ephesians is this beautifully written book. As we said, it's the queen of the epistles, some scholars call it. Um, and it does some amazing things when it comes to wrestling with theology and what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a church. In fact, the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters are devoted almost exclusively to theological doctrine. Who is God? How do we relate to God? What is our relationship with God? The last three chapters of Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 relate to the ethical practices of the Christian in the church. Now that we know who we are, how should we act? How should God's people respond to God? How should we be showing the world we live? And last week we spoke about who we are and we found that we are rooted in Christ. That when God has called us, when we have accepted and we believe in Jesus, that we are a part of God's family. We are adopted into that family. If you want to watch that message from last week, uh, you can just scroll either down or up to the YouTube video. It's out on YouTube now. Or you can scroll through the, uh, the post from this week uh, on Facebook and you'll be able to pull it up right there. Um, but this week we're going to wrestle with what is the role of the church? In fact, I was going to wrestle with that, and I danced around this week trying to figure out whether or not I was going to um, to move further into Ephesians and wrestle specifically with what does it mean to be a church, because it's something all of us no doubt have questions about. If we're not at the building right now, if we're not greeting people, if we don't have chime choir practice or we're doing morning Bible study, and if we don't have kids groups, then what are we doing? Like if we're not shaking each other's hands, if we're not saying hello, if we're not putting an offering into an offering plate, if we're not listening to a sermon, if we're not checking the clock halfway through the sermon, well, then what are we doing? Are we even a church? And we are. I mean, we're absolutely a church. And this is an excellent example of why we're a church, because we're engaging with God. We're spending all week working with each other. So I was going to jump further ahead in the book of Ephesians. And I thought, you know what? No, we're not going to be able to truly appreciate what it is to be a church and have a handle of that until we really have a handle on our relationship with God. And so I'm holding fast, I'm holding strong to this option, which is important for us to understand because right now the world is wrestling with COVID-19. That's why we're not face-to-face -face right now is because there's a virus out there 
that spreads as easily as the common cold, but is far deadlier in many cases than the flu, that it is attacking the most vulnerable in our society, the elderly, those with pre-existing conditions. Um, this is shaping our entire lives. I believe someone, I saw someone say somewhere that um, in 20 years, our kids will be telling their grandkids about the time in which they stayed home for a month or two months straight because of the coronavirus. Um, this, for my generation, is our 9-11. It feels like to them. They're, this is going to be their, I had to walk to school uphill both ways in the snow moment that my grandparents so lovingly had. I mean, this is shaping our youth and shaping our young people, but it's also shaping us. Because the social distancing that we're doing, we're not sure what the end result is going to be. We're not sure when we're going to go back to normal. We're not sure what normal is going to look like out after that. We're not sure when we can physically connect with each other. Um, there are many people in our community, there are many people in our church, no doubt that are wondering what their jobs are going to look like when they come out. They may have been just laid off because the store shut down. And they don't know if it'll open up. Think of all the mom and pop shops that we have around you. That when this is finally over, when we finally can open again, just won't open. Because they can't. They can't afford to. And so this is going to have a lasting effect on our society for a while. And I found it ironic that all the advancements that humanity has made in technology, in science, in how our society looks, runs, even the advancements that we've made in our government, trying to find stability, all of it can be shaken to its core by something so primitive as a virus, something so simple in its design that scientists don't even know if it's considered a life or not. And to that note, I pray often for our doctors and our nurses and our medical staff. I pray for our scientists that all of the advancements we've made in technology can mitigate the impact that they have on this and that it can come through quickly and that lives can be saved because of their hard work. And I pray that we have the courage to do what is needed to protect those who are most vulnerable, who are weaker, who are elderly. And I pray that we are shaped that way. And so I was tempted to dig further in, but I don't think I'm going to. I think we're going to stay on the course and we're going to continue to plot our way through Ephesians so that we can shape our understanding of who we are with God before we wrestle with what does our church look like? What should our church look like? And so today's scripture is from Ephesians. It's chapter one. It's going to be verses seven and eight. And it says this, in him, we have redemption through his blood and his forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Now, if I were to ask you the question, how did Jesus die for our sins? I'm sure most Christians and frankly, non-Christians alike would be able to answer it. How did Jesus die for our sins? Well, he gave his life. He died on the cross. He spilled his blood for the remission of sin, as we say on our communion. I mean, you should have, have a handle on that as Christians at this point. I mean, we have a pretty big holiday coming up in the next few days. Uh, Easter, which circles and surrounds this understanding of how Christ saved us. But a question that I think is harder for Christians to ask is, why did Jesus die for our sins? And the reason I think it's hard for us to ask is because, frankly, we don't like to stare at the mirror long enough to answer that question with honesty. Why did Jesus die for our sins? Because he had to. Because there was no other way. Because we were not making it to the Father as perfect beings without him. This is how it had to be. He went to the cross because it was the final solution, the final answer to reconcile the children of God, which we spoke about last week that we are. I'm going to give you a moment for you to digest that because that is a deep, deep thought. We are so lost as humanity that if he expected us, God expected us to get to his presence, we would not be able to. We couldn't work hard enough. We couldn't pay enough, off enough debts. 
We couldn't change enough to make ourselves there. That's powerful and that's profound and that's been since the beginning of time. You can go to Genesis, the beginning, chapter one and chapter two. God is creating the universe. After every step that God creates the universe, he creates the world, all living creatures, he creates Eden. Every step of the way, he says, it is good. His creation is good. And then we come to Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, and it says, The Lord took the man and put him in the garden to work and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for if you eat from it, you will certainly die. God put us in the garden of Eden and gave us one instruction. Do work. Take care of creation. You're in charge of creation. Take care of them. Just don't eat from the tree of the garden, knowledge of the garden of good and evil. Don't eat from that tree. That's it. A lot of people struggle with this. A lot of people say, well, why would God create the tree anyway? Why would God put man here and then give something that could take it all away from him? Why would God just not leave the tree out? Well, the simple answer is that Eden isn't our home. I mean, Eden is where we live, but it's not ours. Eden was always God's place in creation. This was God's house. We worked there. We got to live there, we worked there, but it was always God's. And so, as we're taking care of creation, as we're doing things, you know the rest of the story. Everything goes perfect, right? Adam and Eve say, no, not a problem. We're not going to do anything. No, not an issue, right? No, it doesn't, it doesn't work out that way. Eve is tempted by the serpent. We see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, the serpent says, take from the fruit, you will certainly not die. I'm paraphrasing here. And then Eve looks at the fruit and says, when the women saw the fruit of the tree was good, for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. So they took from the fruit. Eve was tempted, but the serpent didn't put the desire in her heart for that fruit. She desired what that would give us. And what did that give us? That gave us the ability to understand right and wrong. She essentially gave us subjective morality. There's two forms of morality that people wrestle with, specifically in philosophy. There's objective morality, which is the created being, for us it's God, establishes right and wrong, and we have to fall in line because he's a plane above us, he establishes right and wrong, and we don't have the ability to change it. We can either do the right thing or we can do the wrong thing, but we can't make the right thing wrong and we can't make the wrong thing right. We don't have that ability. Well, we want that ability. People want to be their own judge, jury, and executioner in this world. We see it all the time. We see it in interactions that we have with each other. It's a natural human instinct at this point to want to be in control and the sole arbiter of what is good and what is bad. That's subjective morality, meaning it's on our level. We all determine what is right and wrong, and that's just what right and wrong is. Well, that's what Eve got and Adam got out of that. They were able to then determine, yeah, I don't want to follow that God, or sure, I guess I'll listen to you because I also agree that that law is right. And that is, that is the fall of humanity. Our sin comes out of us worshiping ourselves. Our sin is out of self-centeredness. It is putting our desires first before God's, before other people. And it's all based out of us determining what is right and wrong because we almost universally use a selfish twinge when we do it. And that's what makes it very, very hard. Because we all would rather worship the God of self. We worship the God of self rather than the God Almighty. Humanity has done it forever. We see all through the Bible, the Bible is filled with examples of how not to live. If you get through the book of Judges, 
and you see how everyone is living, you're thinking to yourself, these are not good people. Well, the book of Judges ends on the very last verse. It says, on Judges 21, verse 25, it says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Everyone determined what was right and wrong. And unfortunately, when we determine what is right and wrong, and we don't default to God, then nothing is right and wrong. Because if God's standard doesn't matter to us anymore, and I think that I shouldn't be robbed. I think that it's wrong to steal. But Frank thinks that it's okay to steal. When Frank steals from me, I think he's wrong. He thinks he's right. Neither one of us are right and wrong. Because it's just his opinion versus mine. And humanity gets into these large groups now in which a mob of one people thinks one thing, and then suddenly they believe that that is right and that is wrong. It doesn't work that way. It absolutely doesn't. But that's how we get the Holocaust, where millions of people thought it was okay to execute Jews. It wasn't just one person. It wasn't just Adolf Hitler and maybe his small group that did it. Hundreds of thousands of people had to round them up. Hundreds of thousands of people had to run concentration camps. A lot of people thought it was okay to exterminate Jews during the Holocaust. And that's what we get when people think it's right and wrong. Because they determined it was right. We fought a war to prove that they were wrong. And so, when we ask ourselves, why did Jesus die on the cross for us? The answer was because we needed him to. Because that was the only way out. Because we are so corrupted by this God of self, by this ability to try to determine our own fate, right and wrong, that it has tainted everything for us. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 teaches us that all of us has become like those who are unclean. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags compared to God. What he's saying here is not that everyone is as bad as they could be. No. Some people are better than other people. What he's saying is none of us get to God's level anymore. That even the best of us, the best acts we perform, the best things that we do fall short of God's expectation of perfection to be in his presence. All of us are universally worthy of separation from God. Because none of us can work and act properly. It's a tough pill to swallow. Because there's a follow-up question. When we ask, why did Jesus die for us? And we answer it, because he had to. Then the follow-up question obviously is, well, do we deserve it? Like, do we deserve salvation? And that's answered with a resounding, no, we don't deserve it. We don't earn it. None of our lives, none of our actions have ever put us in a position in which we can look back and say, yeah. Yeah, I should be allowed into God's presence on my own merit. Why not? Why should he keep me out of heaven? I'm a good person. None of our lives reflect that. I want you to all search your hearts and know that this is true. And now, I'm not saying all this because I'm trying to beat you down. I'm not saying all this because I want you to start thinking worse of yourself. I'm not saying all of this because I want you to lose faith and you, I want you to lose hope. I want you to lose hope in yourselves and I want you to apply hope in God. Because it's from this position of humility, of us understanding that we are not worthy, that we can truly open our eyes to the majesty of what God has done, the power that God has given us. And when we read our verse, in him we have redemption through his blood, meaning Christ's sacrifice at the cross, the forgiveness of our sins, that's how we are forgiven. In accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Look at those, that language from Paul. The riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's something that we are unlike. God's grace, God's love for us, God's mercy is unlike anything we ever see in this world. We don't perform it this way. I don't perform it this way. You don't perform it this way. We just don't. 
We don't. Just think about the last time someone hurt you or wronged you. They may come up and ask for forgiveness. They say, what I did was wrong. There's no excuse. I am sorry. And you may forgive them, but do you forget what they've done? Doesn't what they've done to you shape how you react to them going forward? I mean, if someone steals money from you, you may forgive them, but are you going to leave your wallet around them again? What about all those spouses out there after their husband or their wife cheats on them? They may very well forgive them and get to a place of forgiveness, but are they going to trust them the same way again? When the wife or husband says, I have to work late, are they going to be so quick to believe that? In fact, you know what? Infidelity is an excellent example of this. I mean, there's a reason why Jesus gives us parables about him being a bridegroom and us being a bride. Marriage is so instrumental in scripture that uh, we see it all over the place. That we are married to Christ. That the church, which is us, is connected, is one with Jesus in that way. In fact, we can carry that thought all the way through Revelation, all the way through the bad parts of Revelation. We can come to when God is bringing his presence here. We see in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for he, for the marriage of the Lamb, that is Jesus, has come to his bride, that is us, and made herself ready. Marriage illustration is so close because the relationship is that intimate with God. We are that tight in our family. But look at, now look at our actions. When we sin, it's like we're committing adultery against God. When we fail to turn to him when we need him, when we choose to go our own way instead of faithfully following him, when we break the commandments, when we refuse to show love to one another, when we refuse to do all of this stuff, it's just like us breaking those marriage vows. And so if you had a friend whose spouse cheated on them and they said, I'm going to stay with them, you may encourage that. But if the spouse cheats on them over and over and over and over again, and the husband or wife always comes back and I'm so sorry, I'll never do it again. And then a couple days later, they did it again and they did it again and they did it again. At some point you would say, you need to get away from this person. If, they, if it was a fiance relationship, they're not even married yet. And one person is cheating constantly. You're never going to say, yeah, you should totally marry that person. You're not going to give your friend that advice, are you? You'd be looked at as crazy if you're like, yeah, you should totally, totally still marry them even though they cheat on you. Well, that's our relationship with Jesus. He offers salvation to us. He welcomes us into his family. He, may, he chooses to marry us knowing that we're going to commit adultery, knowing that we're going to have to fall on our knees and pray and say, I have failed I have made mistakes. I have cheated on you. And he does it knowing that we're going to say it again the next day. And we're going to say it again the next day. And we're going to say it again the next day. There's a reason why the Lord's Prayer has forgive us our debts in it. Because it's something we need to be doing daily. Because all of us, whether it's big sins or it's little sins, we all violate that relationship we have. But he's working through us. The Holy Spirit is working through us so that we may not be perfect on this end, but we are better tomorrow than we are today. And we see this process of repentance when we fall on our knees and we say, Jesus, I am sorry, and we repent. Repent is more than just asking for forgiveness. Repent is physically turning and walking away from our sin. And it may not be something we're good at if we struggle with anger. We may be repenting a lot. We may be walking further away from that sin over a longer period of time. If we're struggling with addiction, we may not be immediately perfect at walking away. We may be doing it slowly. 
but we are going to be doing it continually walking away as best as we can. And so we have to remember that when it comes to creation, that we are not the victims, that we are the perpetrators. That we violate that trust with Jesus all the time, and yet he loves us. That God knows tomorrow we may be better than we were today, but we are not perfect. And yet he lavishes us with his grace. And I love the beauty of that word. He lavishes us. He doesn't give us grace. He doesn't appoint us grace. He doesn't hand us grace. He lavishes us. The Greek word here for lavish is parousia, which means to overflow, to abound, to exceed what is needed. He gives us more grace than we need. Think about that for a moment with how many much sin we commit. We are so loved by him that when we accept Christ, that when we fall on our knees and we repent and we seek for forgiveness, when we trust in him, when we, as Paul says, profess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess in our, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. When we do that, we're not just forgiven for our sins, we're justified in God's eyes. Justification is this really rich biblically theo biblical theology word. It is really, really rich. And it's essentially a legal argument. It says that God has performed a legal act in which he declares us righteous. He declares us perfect in his sight, innocent of wrongdoing, based on the work of Christ and not the work of ourselves. Think about that for a moment. We sin. We make the mistakes. We err. We're not held accountable for it. We are found innocent because of what Jesus has done. How perfect is that cross that it can take the blackness of all of our sins and eliminate it, wipe away our debt. It doesn't mean we can continue to go on sinning and making mistakes because God's got it anyway. No, it should foster in us humility, should foster us in, in our hearts thanksgiving for all that he has done for us. We should never look away from God, from that cross, because it has done so much for us in our lives. God has forgiven our debts. He has justified us as righteous because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. There's no greater love than that, people. We will never be able to react to other people that way. We will never be able to show the world perfectly how God has done that without getting them to experience it themselves. By pointing them to the cross and having the Holy Spirit transform their hearts. That's the only way the world's going to see this level of love, grace, and mercy. It's it. We might be able to serve shadow, we might be able to show shadows of it in this world with how we interact with people as we wrestle to forgive them more than we do, as we wrestle to get past prejudices for people's past actions. We may be able to get shadows of it, but we're never going to be able to get the whole thing. The Holy Spirit needs to do that in people's lives. And the Holy Spirit does it in people's lives. The Holy Spirit has done it, I pray, in your life. I pray that you get convicted in your heart about how much God has forgiven for you. Because I want us to anchor that in our hope. We need hope right now. We absolutely do. People in this world need hope. This is a scary time. We are filled with uncertainty and there is hope that needs to be sown. And I pray that you anchor this understanding of what God has done in your lives in that hope. Because our hope in God, that's not just hope like we would think. That's not a dream. That's not a wish. 
It's not a hunch that God has it. Biblical hope. Our hope in God is rooted in the fact that we can look back in the Bible, that we can take the Bible and we can look back at all of God's promises that he fulfilled. And we can use that to trust that he will be faithful going forward for us. That is the hope that is anchored in. God promised that Abraham would be a great nation and he delivered. God promised that the Israelites would be taken out of slavery in Egypt and God delivered. God promised that they would be in the Holy Land and he delivered. God promised that he would return the Jews out of exile in Babylon and he delivered. God promised that he would send the Messiah to save the world and he delivered. Jesus promised that his death on the cross would bring salvation to us and he delivered. Jesus promised that he would rise from the dead in three days and it happened. Jesus, God promised that Gentiles, us, you and me, would be grafted in to the chosen people's bloodline. And he delivered. We can trust him with tomorrow because he's proven countless times that we can trust him with tomorrow. Look at your own lives. Find moments in which you struggled with trust, you struggled with doubt, and he got you through it. And I pray that you do this the next few days. I pray whether you're on the phone or by email or somewhere else, I pray that you take moments to remember how God has saved you. And I pray that you share that hope with someone else. Find examples in your life in which God got you through something and remind someone else that he does that. Remind them that your hope is not in your own actions because as we talked about, we are broken. We are broken, sinful people. Our hope is not found in what we can do, but our hope is in what Jesus has done on that cross. Have the courage today to tell someone else about it. Share the gospel. Open someone else's eyes. The world is looking for answers right now, and you have a book of them. Please share that with them. Give them the hope of the cross so that they may be welcomed into God's family. Or if they're in God's family, that they may be Encouraged to stay vigilant through this season that we're going through. So I pray that you do that this week. I pray that you stay safe. I pray that you stay strong. I pray that you remain encouraged. I pray that you read scripture. And I pray that you reach out and do all that you possibly can while protecting yourself for those around us. Please do that for me. If you need assistance, if you need help, if you need something reach out to me. Please be the church. Let them know that the church isn't closed, that it is open and ready for business because the world needs it right now. Let us pray. Lord, be with us today. Please give us a confidence that though we are sinners, that you have cleaned our slate. And let that be inspiration for us to not sin anymore. Lord, you are king. You are savior. You are comforter. And we thank you for all that you've done for us and your continued blessings upon us. Please keep us protected, safe, Lord, and keep us focused on you until we can gather in your name again. For we ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you all very much. Um, this is today's message. Um, we're going to take this week to week. If we are still asked by the state of Maine, um, by Governor Mills, as well as the CDC to stay quarantined um, through next week, then my next sermon will be with a very similar backdrop. I'm not sure if Figment and Snoopy and Billy Joel can make it, um, but I'm sure someone else will be here with me. Um, so if we're going to be here next week, um, please look forward to that message. Please interact with us. 
um, over the course of the week. Um, I will be posting constant encouragements. I'll be posting videos, um, verses of the day, um, things to kind of get us through. And please interact with that as much as you can. Uh, go find us on our Facebook page at smithfieldbaptistmaine.com or smithfieldbaptistmaine. You don't need the dot .com. Um, please um, be with each other show love for each other. I encourage you to reach out to one or two people this week that you don't normally talk to and say, hey, I love you. I miss you. I pray. Is there anything? I pray everything as well. Is there anything we can do? Um, just keep encouraging each other as we go through this season. It's not going to last forever. I don't know how long it's going to be, but it's not going to be forever. The only thing that's going to be forever is eternity with Christ. So um, please be with each other. And if you need anything, just let me know. God bless and have a Blessful rest of your Sunday.